Hello, I'm Anita Hollinshead and I'm the Regional Collections Advisor for Museum Development East Midlands and this short film is going to be an overview of how to pack collections. So we'll start with looking at the principles of packing and the, you know, the reasons why we pack things in the way that we do. And one of the first things is to limit physical damage to the collections that we've packed. So this is using materials that will stop our collections from rolling about in the containers in which we put them and that we will nest our collections within the packing materials, generally within acid-free tissue um, nests, puffs and sausages of acid-free tissue, that will stop things rolling about but will actually minimise the need to handle objects as well. In principle we should be able to lift the lid off our box of objects and see what the contents are or see what the contents are without having to disrupt things very often. And that's why we don't, we generally avoid wrapping collections in tissue paper because the unwrapping can cause quite a bit of physical damage. Um, it's much better if we can just look at them, just lift a small lid of tissue and have a look at what's in our box. We also know that packing materials, so if we pack our objects in a box with um, acid-free tissue paper, that acts as a buffer against fluctuating relative humidity and temperature. So although that might fluctuate greatly outside of the box, the effect that that has on the collections that are inside the box is minimised considerably. It's also a way to reduce pest activity. Most boxes are not airtight and so pests can get in, but it certainly slow them down and you know, reduce that risk as well. And it's also to protect collections from dust and dirt and from poor handling. So we've got here, we've got a photograph in a, a Melanex sleeve and we're protecting it from damage by handling. So dust and dirt, um, dust is mainly composed of things like old skin cells, uh, remains of insects, animal hair, maybe some of the side effects of industrial pollution. Not things that are very good for our collection, so by keeping things within some sort of enclosure or container we can reduce that risk. It's also um, about the materials that we use to pack our collection. So in principle those should be inert, they should be they shouldn't give off any kind of vapours or gases that would cause harm and damage to the collections. So I'm going to kind of go through a few of those suitable materials. So the, the first thing that we uh, tend to use is acid-free tissue. This is an example of an acid-free tissue sausage and an acid-free tissue puff. We're going to have a go at making those in a minute. And then we have a selection of materials which boxes might be made from. So we've got things like corrugated board, acid-free board. We've got a material here called Corex, which is a corrugated plastic, um, which you can cut to size and make into boxes, or, or you can buy ready-made boxes. I've already uh, talked to you about Melanex, of archival quality polyester that we might use in photographic enclosures. We've got a couple of more examples here of uh, booklets and um, photographs that have been packed in these types of enclosures. If you've got to pack and store photographs, there's a whole range of materials available. But if you do have a mixture of, of photographic materials in your collection, then either Photon, which is this material, or Argentia are the, are the recommended materials to use for that. Other packing materials that you'll need are inert polyethylene foams, such as plastazote or ether foam. This is plastazote and it comes in a range of colours and thicknesses. It can be cut to, to fill boxes, to line the bottoms of drawers, to protect and support objects, to even to create plinths and, and book supports as well. So later in this film I'm going to show you how to make a simple plastazote liner for a box. So we also need uh, materials that we can use for packing and storing our textile and costume collections. And that will include things like uh, this polyester wadding that can be used to uh, make padded hangers. It will be then covered with unbleached calico. We might use unbleached calico to create garment covers. Or a material called Tyvek, which is a spun bonded polyolefine which can be stitched and cut to shape and washed. We also would have some unbleached cotton tying tape 
This can be used to hold collections that have been rolled around inert cardboard tubes um, in place. It can also be used for ties for textile um, covers as well. There are a couple of things that I've got here that um, we wouldn't use for long-term storage because they're not exactly inert materials but they have great cushioning properties. We want materials that have great cushioning properties. So for short term, very short term storage, so perhaps when you're moving collections, you can make these little pillows. It's a food grade plastic bag, that's important. And then we've got just polystyrene chips inside there. Um, and that makes a really good supportive pillow for you know, temporary use. As does bubble wrap. Bubble wrap has great cushioning properties, but it's also not, uh, it's not what we would call an archival quality material or conservation quality material. If it gets a bit damp and it's wrapped around objects, it will also leave a sort of dimply pattern on the surface. But bubble wrap has great cushioning properties, so for short term use it can be very useful. So that's the sort of overview of the types of materials that you um, would use for packing and now we're going to look in a bit more detail at some examples of boxes and packing methods but we're going to start by making some tissue paper sausages and tissue paper puffs which are sort of like our basic packing materials. So now I'm just going to show you how to make tissue paper puffs and tissue paper sausages that you can use to pack your collections into a box and they're very important in terms of cushioning objects against damage and also stopping if you've got multiple objects in a box they stop them knocking into each other. So we're going to start with the tissue puff and what the principle of this is that we want it to incorporate as much air as possible. So what we do to begin with is scrunch up the tissue paper in order to grab some air into it. So I'm just going to do that now. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this corner into the centre and then I'm going to bring in the other edges until I've made this kind of shape with a sort of dome top. There are multiple ways in which you can do this um, and have a go yourselves, but as long as you end up with a shape that you can use to pack and protect and cushion your collections, that's the most important thing. So what I'm going to do is just put this bit into the middle. And there we are, and I've sort of tucked the ends in. I'm just going to push it like that. And there we are, there we've got one of our tissue paper puffs ready to start doing that. Now, you might need them to be larger than that, in which case use bigger sheets of tissue paper and use multiple uh, sheets of tissue paper. Now the other shape that we need to make is a tissue sausage. So this is one that I made earlier, um, which was to pad out the sleeve of a shirt. Um, I've used several sheets of tissue to do that, to make it quite big. Um, this is a, a narrower sausage um, and it shows two different versions of how to finish them off. So you can do a little twist at the end or you can poke the end in with your fingers, um, as I've done here. You have your sheet of tissue paper. Again, let's scrunch it up and incorporate as much air into it as we can. And now what we're going to do is we look, that's about the middle, don't have to be exact, and I'm going to concertina, I'm going to fold in the uh, tissue into the middle like this. And all the time incorporating more air into the shape as I go along. Once I've got to roughly the middle, I'm just going to roll it up. like that and then we can either poke the ends in like that at the end or we can give it a little twist. Depends what you're using it for and the idea is that these sausages can, can you, you know they say oh you should be able to have a sword fight with them you know because they're quite robust. So lots of air in there and then you're ready to start thinking about how you might pack your boxes. 
Here we have a really nicely packed um, acid-free box from the collections here at Leicestershire. And what I'm going to do is just show you how they've used acid-free tissue in order to pack this box. So we take the lid off and you can see that the box has been lined with sheets of paper that we can just lift back like this. And you'll recognise the shapes in here, so we've got some nice tissue paper puffs, which I'm just going to take out. And you can see now how those objects have all been uh, packed in here, how they've been nested in acid-free tissue, um, with tissue between the objects so they don't roll around, but that I can see everything in that box without having to handle it. So that's the kind of look that you're aiming for. And if you are going to pack objects on top of other objects, put the tissue puffs in between them, but also put the heaviest objects at the bottom and the lighter objects on top. Avoid packing anything that's going to get crushed at the bottom of a box. So I'm just going to put the puffs back in, repack this box, and we're going to have a look at another example. Next we're going to look at a couple of different ways of packing costume. So the first is in a costume box. So we've got our acid-free costume box here. Um, and I'm just going to take the lid off, pop it down here. And you can see that this box has been lined with acid-free tissue, which I'm just going to lift away for you. It's a good idea to check that your acid-free tissue is still acid-free. Um, once a year you can get a pH pen, you just draw onto the acid-free tissue and if it changes colour you know whether your tissue is still acid-free or if you need to change it. You can see now that we've just got this simple lid of tissue paper here so that we can see the costume underneath and we don't have to handle it to get a good first look at it. Now one of the principles in terms of packing any kind of textile or costume is that you don't want any folds, you don't want to be sort of crushing the fibres, you don't want uh, folds because that becomes an area of weakness and over time that's where fibres can become really brittle. So what you want to do is to sort of pad out the shapes, the sleeves, the legs of costume so that you avoid having those folds and you're supporting them without stretching them but also costume was made to fit around a human form and so you're trying to gently recreate that so that the costume is kind of supported in the shape it was originally made in. So you can see here that um, the sleeves of this dress we've got the tissue sausages like the ones we've just been making inside those sleeves and they're padded out but they're not in any way stretched and there are no folds because of the way that they're supported. And then if we were to uh, lift these back you can see that the rest of the costume is underneath here. It's, it's gently, um, it's not folded but it's kind of wrapped around a tissue paper form so that it keeps its shape um, we don't have any folds or creases so um, so that's the way that you might pack a costume inside a box it's a good idea to check regularly at least once a year but more often if possible for any signs of insect pest damage um, or if you've got things like metal fasteners that they're not uh, staining corroding and staining costume as well. You might want to keep them separately. So I'm just going to put that back together again. And show you the other type of costume um, packing. 
Now we're going to look at costume that is in a garment cover and that would be hung up on a hanger on a rail. Um, there are advantages to this. It's an easy way to hang your costume up. It's easy to retrieve things to see what you've got, particularly if you were to uh, attach a photograph on the outside of the garment cover of the costume that's inside it, so it can reduce the need to handle it. This one is made from Tyvek, um, which is a spun burned polyolefin, but you can also make them from calico. You can buy them ready-made or you can buy them to fit your costume. If you are buying unbleached calico and you're going to make garment covers or hanger covers, do wash it at 60 degrees first because it will shrink otherwise and then you've made something to fit your costume once you've washed it in the future it won't fit anymore. You can undo the zip here at the front and um, we can just gently sort of wiggle that hanger out of here and you can see we've got this 1960s play suit in here. I'll just very carefully just remove the cover. And you can see that's been hung. And what's interesting as well, you can see that this has been hung on a padded hanger, um, which just holds the shape of the shoulders. And that some of the other accessories that go with the play seat are in a little Tyvek bag tied around the hanger with some cotton tying tape. And here's the object label, which is on another form of Tyvek, actually. Um, and that's tied on, again, with cotton tying tape. So you can see, um, you can see the costume here that was, contain was, was within the garment bag. Now, there are lots of you know, positive things about um, packing costume like this on garment rails. But there are also times when it's not appropriate. And particularly if uh, the shoulders of the garment are not very strong, so if you've got very sort of flimsy shoulder straps, there might be lace, you might have a very heavy weighted hem on a garment which would kind of cause it to stretch and sag when you put it on a hanger. So you need to think about whether it's appropriate. If you've got a lot of trimmings, beads, feathers, things like that, it's probably more appropriate to keep those costumes inside a box um, so that when you take the lid off the box you can, you can see the garment that way rather than have it on a hanger. So you need to weigh up which is the best um, method for the costumes that you've got in your collection. The other thing is that when you're hanging costumes on a rail, you need to not jam too many costume bags onto one garment rail. Don't crush them together um, to save space. You do, again, need to just keep regularly checking. This is a wool play seat, lovely food for moths. So you do need to check at least once a year and check and things like under the collars and under these little um, little tabs here because those are the kind of places where moths might uh, cause damage by eating it. I'd just like to show you these uh, really useful boxes. So they're made from inert polypropylene and they're transparent and they're very rigid and strong. They're stackable they come in a whole range of sizes and they have these blue lockable handles at either end. So um, that's just another possible uh, option for storage and this one has a whole range of different collections in it separated with tissue paper puffs and then a tissue lid over the top. So another type of uh, box that you could use for packing, remembering our sort of principle of minimal handling, packing things so they don't need to be handled too often, is we can use boxes, acid-free boxes with archival polyester lids like this one. So we can see this nicely packed blackbird supported um, with tissue puffs, shaped pieces of tissue, so it doesn't roll about in the box, but we can easily see the contents of the box without having to take the lid off and without having to handle it. We're just going to have a look at some examples of using plastazote, so that's our inert foam, to cut and create liners for our enclosures or drawers or boxes and so on. So here we have an example. This is that bottle of Spirit of Sal. Um, it's again, it's in a box with a clear lid and some images of the contents on the outside. And if we just take the lid off, 
you can see there's the bottle nesting nicely in its plastisote liner and if I just take that out you can see that plastisote liner that's been cut to shape um, to fit the bottle in so that it doesn't roll around while it's in the box. I'm now going to replace the bottle into the box like that, pop the lid back on. You can also see um, we've got a First World War Peace Medal here in an acid free box, little piece of tissue over the top because it's got quite a sharp pin in it and this has got a lining of plastisote. The pin of the medal is, is just stuck slightly into the plastisote so that it doesn't rock around or move. It's a very good way of stopping sort of two-dimensional objects from rolling around, so things like medals and so on. So finally, we'll just have a look at, um, at this box here. So again, we've got a clear archival polyester lid, which I'm just going to lift off there. And within this box, you've got little individual trays, so you can put individual objects in each of these trays. You might put them in a nest of acid-free tissue, or um, what we have here is um, it's a Norfolk Museum's badge, and it's in a plastisote liner. So you can see we've got these little tabs of archival tying tape, um, and they're there so that it's easy for us to just quickly pull the end of that and it's easy to lift the badge out. If we didn't do that, it would sort of get stuck. Um, the other thing you could do is you could cut little um, holes at the side little that are the shape of a finger so that you could just put your fingers in and pull it out. And then I'm just going to take this apart so you can see how it's constructed. So you've got one sort of thicker piece of plastisote with the hole cut out of it and a thinner piece of plastisote cut to size to line the box. And I'm just now going to demonstrate how to do that so that you can do this for sort of two-dimensional um, and objects in your own collections. Just going to do a demonstration of how to cut a plastisote liner for a box. So um, this is the, the finished product, if you like. Um, so we've got our Norfolk Museum's badge here in the plasters outliner. We've got a little piece of archival tying tape which just releases the badge out of its, out of its uh, form. So we're going to have a go now at making one of these. We're going to start by making a paper template and in order to do that I'm going to look at the box, I'm going to pop it on the paper. Our template, our lining piece wants to be a little bit smaller than the box so I'm just going to make a mark there and I'm using a cutting mat um, and you can get them in all sizes from A5 to A1 so you don't necessarily need one as large as this but they are very handy for this kind of work. So let's just check, that's a little bit too long um, so I'm just going to trim a little bit more off the end. When you get the template the right size it makes life a little bit easier later on. Let's have a look. Yep, there we are. Then I'm going to take my piece of plasters out, pop the template on and draw around it. And there we are, that's fitted, lined the bottom of that box. So the second piece of plastisote needs to be the same size as the first piece, but then we need to cut out our hole in the middle to fit the badge in. So I'm just going to take the template, I'm going to place the badge on the template and I'm going to draw around it. And I'm going to be very careful that I don't get pencil on this um, object in this piece of the collection. I'm just going to cut round it with my scalpel. I'm just 
just going to take the ruler and I'm going to cut the plastisote out again along that edge. Okay, tip, there we go. And then I'm just going to cut the shape out for the badge in the middle there. And you just might want to just trim off any sort of rough edges. Pop it in the box. Pop your piece of cotton tying tape in the middle there. And in goes your badge. And there we are. it in the box with the others. That's the end of our quick introduction to packing collections in a way that minimises the risk of damage and protects them for the future. Thank you for watching.